Matthew chapter 26 this evening. I want to read to you a few verses from, uh, to me, a very special portion of Scripture. Matthew chapter 26 and in verse number 36, the Bible says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as... Thou will. Tonight I want to highlight to you the phrase in verse 39 where the Bible says, And he went a little farther. And I want you to see that just as Jesus went a little farther, so is it necessary for us to do the same. And you'll understand why by the end of the message. This last year I had the privilege to go to the country of Israel for the third time. And the reason that trip holds some great significance is because of some special people that are here in this auditorium that we're in on the, that trip. And I would just like to publicly say that, that Sharon behaved herself in Israel. Although the country will never be the same after her visit, uh, it, she did behave herself. But I've been three times. And uh, every time... Uh, I always learn. Every time it seems like there's something that overwhelms me. And I'll admit the first time I went in 2010, I felt like I was drinking from a fire hydrant the entire trip. There was just so much to absorb. There was so much to see. I remember in that first trip, the first time that I ever saw the Sea of Galilee, in that particular tour, the way they structured it, is they said, uh, you're going to see the Sea of Galilee for the first time when you climb this thing called the Arbel Cliff. Uh, at that point, we had not really driven through the central part of Israel. And they said, you're going to come to the top of this peak and you're going to look down and you're going to see the Sea of Galilee. And I still remember walking up that peak. And uh, after I got to the top, lo and behold, there was the Sea of Galilee. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. A sea that is about seven miles wide, 14 miles long, and you just see it's just, I mean, it is sunk down uh, in that valley, in that area there. No wonder storms came up suddenly with the way that that setting was. And I remember being on the Sea of Galilee. Later, we'd go out on a boat, and we'd just go out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. I thought, man, this is where the disciples almost died twice. This is where Peter sees the Lord and makes his, the resurrected Lord, and makes his way to him. And I thought, boy, this is a special sight. Uh, I remember uh, one sight that didn't carry the greatest significance per se, but it was really funny. I'll never forget it. We were at this place that was called the Tomb of David. It's in Jerusalem. It's a place that's purported to be where David was buried, but many people believe that he wasn't because he probably was buried in the city of David, which was in the southern part of Jerusalem, and you say, well, why was this so funny if you don't think that David was, was buried there? Uh, well, that first trip, one of my professors, his name was Do is Dr. Surrett, and he was with us on that trip. He's one of the most conscientious men you'll ever meet. Uh, I'm telling you, he's very conscientious and wants to make sure that he does everything right. Well, as we were walking into the tomb of David area, there were people that were telling us, no cameras, no cameras, no cameras because it was a holy sight. And so I was a little disappointed, and I put my camera down. And I go walking through there, and you see these people praying and all kinds of different things, and you see this edifice that's symbolic of the tomb of David. But while I was walking through, I looked around, and Brother Surrett had his camera, and he was snapping pictures left and right. And so when we got out, I looked at him, and I said, Brother Surrett, I hate to tell you this, but they said at the beginning, they said for you not to use cameras because this was a holy sight. And he looked terrified. He said, oh, he said, I am so sorry. He said, why didn't you tell me to stop taking pictures? And I said, because I want a copy of your pictures. That's why. You know, there were a lot of different things that we saw in Galilee. 
Uh, of course, the empty tomb, and there's a story behind us getting to see that this last time. Uh, it was a very frustrating day when we were in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a gay pride parade that was taking place and had locked the entire city into just just gridlock. And we sat on a bus and we made the decision to make the hike uh, through the city of Jerusalem to get to the empty tomb. Listen, when you have a bus full of Christians and the empty tomb is the last thing for you to see and you are in a traffic jam, there's no other option. You get out and you walk as fast as possible to see it. And I will admit that God worked through all of our frustrations that day and it really was a special time at the tomb. But do you know the first time that I went to Israel, there was a specific place that moved me more than any other. It's not because... Uh, it's necessarily number one on everybody's list. As a matter of fact, if you had told me this is going to be the place where you're moved the most when you visit Israel, I would have said, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, there's the Temple Mount and there's, you know, the, there's the empty tomb and, and these different things. I, I would have probably taken exception to it. But I'll never forget that day we started on top of the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives is the largest Jewish graveyard in the world. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to the religious crowd in Matthew 23, 24, somewhere in there? And He said, Ye whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Now that's pretty strong language, but the Mount of Olives was the object lesson that Jesus very well could have been pointing to. The largest Jewish graveyard in the world with these raised white boxes where people put the bones of their descendants and you start at the top of the Mount of Olives and you look down and you see all of these white above ground edifices that, I mean, they're all over the place. It's interesting when you see those white boxes, you'll notice that there are rocks on them. Uh, the first time I went to Israel, I remember seeing the, the stones that were placed on top of those boxes and I thought, my stars, somebody's gone through here and vandalized it. And as I was about to move one, the guide said, don't touch that. I said, why not? He said, because this is the way that they pay their respects to the dead. He said, you in America, you lay flowers at graves here. They place stones on top of these. So somebody placed them there. Please don't touch them. And I said, yes, sir. But we made our way down the Mount of Olives and we came down into that valley into a place that was called Gethsemane. As in the case in Israel, in many places, the Catholic Church and other denominations have sometimes constructed large edifices on these places. And the edifices themselves mean really very little to me, if anything. But our tour guide took us into a garden and he said, Now listen, he said, I would like to just say a few things and then I want to give you the opportunity to go through the garden yourself. But this is what's commonly known as the Garden of Gethsemane. And the guide was very quick to say, Now listen, um, these trees that you see, now these weren't the actual ones that were here when Jesus was here. But he said, still, nonetheless, the setting was typically the same and it was filled with a grove of olive trees. And, you know, I don't know about you here in Missouri, but we just don't have a lot of olive trees back home in North Carolina. The olive tree is a fruit-bearing tree. It's somewhat gnarled. It's not the most attractive tree, but the, the, the leaf itself is somewhat greenish and silver depending on how it's turned. And the wood, when it is laid bare and it is shined, has an absolutely beautiful uh, sheen to it. It has a beautiful look to it. It's not like when you cut down a tree and you see all these oak rings or all these rings. No, the, the, uh, the, uh, the olive wood has a distinctiveness to it that's unlike any other thing that I've ever seen. But after explaining to us all of those things about the Garden of Gethsemane, he invited us and he said, now listen, he said, I want you to take some time and I want you to reflect. And I still remember that day I walked around the grove and I looked at this particular olive tree that I felt like it had my name on it. And uh, boy, I just found myself knelt there for a few minutes, kneeling there for a few minutes. And I said, I said to myself, Lord, I'm ashamed, but so often I'm like those disciples that slept instead of your son that prayed. And I was reminded of this story. I was reminded of this time of intimacy that Jesus had with His heavenly Father as He's on the eve of Calvary and all of the events that take place with that. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I can't take you to Israel, but with God's help, I do want to take you to Gethsemane. 
I want you to be able to find Gethsemane. I want you to be able to see it clearly in you, with your eyes. And in order for you to see it, in order for you to find it, you've got to see these three things. Because without these three things, you can't see Gethsemane. Without these three things, you can't understand the import of what took place. And I believe with all of my heart that it's important for Christians to catch the spirit of what happened at Gethsemane and to display that spirit in your own life. And hence this evening I want to deal with the phrase a little farther. Jesus went a little farther. My question is, are you? Now to help us understand Gethsemane and to see it very clearly, there's three things that you need to see tonight. Number one, Gethsemane is a place of solitude. Gethsemane is a place of solitude. In the previous verses, Jesus is spending time with His disciples. Peter has just declared that he's not going to forsake Jesus. And soon thereafter, the Bible says, Jesus... Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And He said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. As Jesus is approaching the sacrifice on Calvary, as Jesus is approaching the amount of pain, both physically, mentally, and emotionally, and spiritually, that man could, could never possibly ever imagine in its totality. Jesus takes the time to isolate Himself and He says to His disciples, Listen, I, I, sit here while I go and pray yonder. You know, the word yonder, that's a word I understand very well. I was raised with that word. If I had a nickel for every time I'd use that word and heard it, we probably could all eat at a nice restaurant tonight and still have a tip to leave over. But he says, well, I want to go there to pray. Now, you're going to find later on in the verse that the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, uh, you, you find that, the, that, the two, that Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, they're going to enter in with him a little further. But I don't want you to lose the importance of solitude when it comes to praying. Now that kicks against so much in the multitasking American mindset. Uh, we have the capability to put our calendars online, to put them on our devices. Uh, we have all kinds of appointments to keep. And do you know with all of those tools, we still, we still manage to crowd out God. We still manage for Him to get lost in the haze of our day, and yet Jesus has such a focus that at this point the most important thing is to have a time of solitude and spend it in speaking to His heavenly Father. Perhaps I could say it this way tonight, and it might be stated in a coy way that convicts us, but I would rather the Holy Spirit convict us tonight. But if I said it this way, if Jesus needed to pray, don't you think we need to pray? I want to ask you as a Christian tonight, do you have a practice of solitude? Now there's this thing called meditative contemplation that you find in some uh, circles of Christianity today. I'm not talking about staring at a wall and zoning out. But I am talking about just taking some time, getting alone, and talking with the Creator of this universe. Jesus had a practice of solitude. In prayer. I was talking to somebody earlier today and I was telling them, be careful about your children growing up so quickly because you're going to look back and say, boy, you know, this, this, the, they were precious in these days. But I remember when my kids were smaller and uh, all, let's, I think at this point, let's say Karis was probably five years old, so that put the others in the 10 and above t uh, age bracket. But it was interesting, in the Beale household, especially when all the kids were smaller, uh, sometimes as a husband I wanted to talk privately with my wife. And I did not want my children to hear. 
You know, isn't it incredible how children, they can scream and holler, but the very moment you start talking about something sensitive, there's like an impulse that goes off in them and says, be quiet, mom and dad are talking. And I, 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 listen, if you want your kid to, kids to start behaving and stop talking, just start talking about personal matters. It works every time. And so here we are, we're in the living room, I'm talking to my wife, I don't think they're listening. All of a sudden they get quiet and I look at them and I'm like, what's wrong? And they said, nothing. And I'm like, well, keep talking. And they're like, no, we want to listen to you. And so at that point, as I've done on several occasions, as they were smaller, I'd say, listen, mom and I are going to go to the bedroom, we're going to talk. Now the reason I wanted that space is because I wanted to talk to her in a fashion that I didn't want their ears hearing. Maybe it was about them. Maybe it wasn't about them, but the, because of the lack of maturity, I just did not want them to hear it. And so that particular day, I went with Michelle. We went to the bedroom, and I remember I shut the door, locked it, and I walked over to the other side of the carpeted bedroom, and right before I was to start, something told me, turn around and look at the door. And I looked at the door, and I saw three sets of feet by that threshold. And so I just quietly walked over there and made my way, yanked the door open and all three of them caught red-handed, ears turned, just listening. At that point I look at them and I said, all right, we're going to play this game, go outside until I tell you to come back in. And their whiny voice, well, how long do we have to st-? I said, count to a million. Start there. Count to a million by ones. And when you're done, come back in. And I, why did I do that? I wanted them to leave us alone so that I could have some time to talk with my spouse. Now, have you ever been in a situation in life where you wanted to talk to somebody and it just you wanted it just to be the two of you because of the intimacy of it or because of the importance of it? Well, let me ask you, if we feel that way in our communications about human beings, don't you think we ought to have that time for God? A couple of years ago, I was talking to a gentleman whose job changed because of COVID. When COVID hit, it turned his employment upside down, and because of that, he had to find other employment. His employment, up to that point, he only had to drive two miles to work, and the pay was great, and now he just doesn't have a job. He finds another job, and it's a 45-minute commute one way. We were talking after a service one night, and he came up to me, and he said, You know, Brother Beal, he said, I was in, uh, he said, he told me about his job situation, how he lost his job. He said, the Lord gave me another job, but it was a 45-minute drive one way. And he said, Boy, for a while, it really bothered me. All I could think about was how easy I had it instead of thanking the Lord for a job. But he said, Let me tell you something that transformed my life. When I finally came to the point to stop griping and I said, you know what, I'm going to take that drive every morning and I'm just going to talk to the Lord. He said, it's transformed me. I want to ask you again, do you have a place of solitude where you just go and you talk to the Lord? Sometimes in our Christian lives we need to recalibrate. Sometimes we need to reprioritize. And you can't be like Jesus. You can't find Gethsemane unless you're willing to find, first of all, that place of solitude. But not only is Gethsemane a place of solitude, the second thing that I want you to see is that Gethsemane is a place of sorrow. I wish I could tell you that every part of the Christian life was filled with fun, and the absence of pain. But that's not always the case. The reason why? Because life just is not the absence of pain. But here is the thing that we must realize. While life does bring us pain, God does give us grace. But Gethsemane is a place of sorrow. Jesus knew what it was like to have a broken heart. As a matter of fact, some people would say that Jesus died on the cross of a broken heart. 
as he bore the sins of mankind. You see this in verse 37. It says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. You live life long enough and you'll know sorrow and you'll know heaviness. There are times when things occur. There are times when it's our lot to bear things that at least in our humanity, we say, is it even possible? I remember the first time as an adult, I said to myself, I don't think I can handle this. I still remember it. I've had that thought probably on a number of occasions since then, just a secret between us. But when you feel that weight and you feel that heaviness, what do you do? Jesus took that sorrowfulness and He took that heaviness and He took it to His heavenly Father. If you want to find Gethsemane tonight, then you take your heaviness and you take your sorrow to God Almighty. In verse 37 when it says He began to be sorrowful and then it says, and very heavy. You know, this is a way of talking about the distress, about the heaviness of the soul. Has your soul ever been very heavy, been very distressed? Several, uh, maybe a year or so ago, there was a, a guy in our small town who owned several properties and some people had moved out and they had left one item in there and it was a huge piano. And he called me up one night and he said, Alton, he said, I got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, I have this huge piano that these renters left in my place and I know they're not going to move it and I've got to move it out in order to get it ready for the next person. He said, is there any way? He said, I'll pay you 40 bucks to just move it and you take it and do whatever you want with it. Well, I thought to myself, I said, well, this is a money-making endeavor. I'll tell you what, I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll shoot out a text to all the college guys, and if I can get four, four guys, they make ten bucks a piece for five minutes of work. I mean, how easy is that? And so I did. I put it out there. I pulled in front of the bookstore, and sure, and sure enough, there were four guys, and thank the Lord, they were all of good build. Uh, they all hopped in the back of my truck. They said, where are we going? I said, we're going to just drive right around the corner here. We're going to go down this double wide. We just have to move a piano. I said, when it's over with, I'll give you 10 bucks. It won't be any problem. They said, well, that's easy enough. And so we walked inside that double wide. Here was this huge piano, and it was just an old upright made of lead back in the 1600s. It, <laughs> caster wheels broken. It just was, it was a curse. That's the only thing I know to say it was. And uh, so those four guys, they start pushing and grunting and manipulating. And, you know, we're getting it through there. And we finally get it out on the front porch. And I take my little pickup truck and I back it up. And I come to the realization, I'm like, this thing is so heavy that when we load this thing on the truck, I don't want to load it on the tailgate because I'm afraid the straps just snap. I thought, we're going to have to set this thing right into the heart of the truck and Hope I can get it somewhere. And so the four of us, I told the boys what we were going to have to do. I told these young men, I said, now listen, I said, we're going to have to get uh, this heavy thing. We've got to lift it up enough to where we bring it over the tailgate and we put it into the actual bed of the truck. I said, do you understand that? They said, yes. And then the most amazing thing happened. Three of them got on that end of the piano and me and one of the scrawniest ones are here on this side having to load it into the truck. Now part of me is in disbelief. Another part of me is filled with pride. That's a horrible position to be in. And so I was like, all right. I said, all we got to do is just say one, two, three, lift. And when we lift, you guys have got to bring it our way. And I thought that was going to be easy. And when I said one, two, three, and I said lift, and he and I lifted that side of the piano by ourselves, my brain is asking me, why have you, why are you doing this? My back is saying, you've not had a strain like this in a long time. Now the end of the story, we got it over. We got the piano out. 
I paid them each $10. But when it was over with, I sat in the truck and there were parts of my body that were saying this was a bad idea. I still remember being under the strain of that thing so much physically. It's when as you get older and your mind's telling you, listen buddy, I think you pushed it a little too hard. Boy, I still remember the physical heaviness of that object. But I'm going to tell you what. I would rather lift a heavy piano than some loads that we've had to bear on some days. You know, at least sometimes physically, you're like, if I can just sit here and catch my breath. There are other times there's a heaviness that settles in your soul that seems to suck the life out of you. What do you do when those times come? What did Jesus do? Jesus said, I'm going to go a little farther and I'm going to pray. Listen to me, if you're going to find Gethsemane tonight, first of all, you're going to see it's a place of solitude. It's got to be you and God. Number two, it's a place of sorrow. It's a place where you go with a heavy heart. In verse 38, Jesus said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. As Jesus further expresses Himself, He says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. You ever read the Psalms when the psalmist is talking to himself and he talks about my soul, why art thou thou cast down? You know, one of the reasons I love reading the Psalms is I'm like, there's a normal human being that feels and hurts like I do and he's writing what's on his heart. And if you're here tonight and there's a heaviness that's in your soul, I'm not talking about a bone weariness. I'm talking about a heaviness in your soul. I want to encourage you to do what Jesus did and find Gethsemane and be willing to go a little farther. But if you're going to find Gethsemane tonight, you're going to see that not only is it a place of solitude, not only is it a place of sorrow, but the last thing I want you to see tonight is that Gethsemane is a place of submission. In verse 39, the Bible says, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now there's a couple of things that I want to address and explain before... I wrap up this idea of submission. The first thing is when you look at it and it says, if this cup uh, may not pass away from me, or excuse me, when he says, let this cup pass from me. What is this cup? All right, It's not a physical, literal cup. And there are some people that argue so much over this, it makes me a little ill at times because sometimes I think they miss the forest for the trees. You know, people are like, what specifically is this cup? I mean, in this cup, was it this? Was it that? Was it this? Was it that? And I just say to people, listen, look at what's about to happen. And I almost want to say, take your pick. It all is sorrowful. It all is heavy. Jesus is about to bear the iniquities of the entire world. It's bad enough with those of us in this room. Now think upon the billions of people. He's to bear their iniquity. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It is impossible for us to understand the amount of pain and the amount of agony and the amount of suffering that was ahead. And so I encourage my friends, instead of getting so caught up in the specifics, could the cup specifically have been this? I say take a look at what is ahead and that will help you to understand the agony that Jesus was enduring. But then in the latter part of verse 39, Jesus says, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. 
Now I want to say Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, but Jesus is God. The Bible very clearly declares that. If you have any doubt about whether or not Jesus is God, just read the book of John. That is the book of all of them that if anything speaks directly to that, John, John does, even in John chapter 1. But I want to be very careful in what I say tonight because I don't, want, I don't want you to think for a moment that Jesus didn't want to go to the cross in the sense that Jesus had to be forced to go to the cross. No, I think Jesus, His determination was set. He came, He left heaven's glory specifically to go to the cross and to die for your sins and mine. But when we come to the end of verse 39, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You say, well, that seems a little contradictory to me. God the Son saying to God the Father. It's like, not as I will. It sounds like there's some submission there that needs to take place. I, I want to tell you the best way that I know to describe it is this. Not only was Jesus... 100% God, but He's also 100% man. And I want to speak to His humanity for just a moment. When Jesus says, Not my will, but thine be done, it's not the idea of Jesus being a rebellious teenager, but I believe that it is a subjection of the humanity of Jesus to God the Father. Are you allergic to pain like I am? Suffering. I want you to think about the pain that Jesus is going to experience. In the song, the offertory song, as I was reading the words, the lyrics, and uh, you notice, uh, I mean, the, the wounds of Jesus being described so vividly. His hands, His feet. Some of you are like five wounds and His side. All on Calvary. But the hands and the feet, the thorns... The cat of nine tails. Jesus was submitted to an amount of pain that human beings could not even begin to fathom. And yet, knowing that that was ahead, Jesus said, Not my will, but thine be done. That's a tremendous example of submission to us. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's a big difference between me and Jesus. There's a lot of differences, but one of them's this. There have been some times I really didn't want to submit to God, and it was out of rebellion. It wasn't just the fact, well, I'm a human being, and I'm telling you, I'm going to have to swallow hard. No, there have been times in my life where I didn't always agree with God. And there are times in your life where you don't always agree with Him. Listen, if you're here tonight and you're living a life of self-will, you're living a life of self-indulgence, listen to me, you'll never find Gethsemane until you come to the blessed point of saying, Not my will, but thine be done. You can be in this room and you can pray with great flowery eloquence. I remember on a missions trip to Jamaica, there was a man... He stood out by a van and he prayed the most flowery, eloquent prayer I've ever heard in my life. I mean, he got there. He said, I'd like to pray for you all. And I'm, you know, I know he's praying, but I'm listening. I'm like, wow, this guy's got a silver tongue. And when the guy walked off, the missionary, once he got out of distance, the missionary looked at us. He said, you won't believe this, but he said, that guy's as lost as can be. That man had all kinds of great eloquence. He had great oratory. And you know what? Some of us may be here. You can pray a prayer that would be a barn burner for everybody else. But without submission, it's just like vain jangling. You want to talk about coming? Listen, instead of coming to God with your own prep propositions or your own, uh, your, your, your own uh, will and direction, the best thing we can do is when we come to God, it's not my will but thine be done. And the longer I live, the more I'm seeing that's the way to live. And you know, and I don't care. A lot of times, I spend a lot of times talking to teens, and I talk about saying, "Not my will, but thine be done." But I'm going to tell you what: adults, seniors, I don't care where you're at in the spectrum. You're going to come against things in life that you will not like, things that you that that you want to resist, and maybe God has for you, and you have to say, "Not my will, but thine be done." 
And let me tell you what submission's not. Submission is not, well, I guess I'll go through it, but I'm going to tell you what, I don't like it, and, uh, but I'll go through it. That's not submission. Jesus is not going to like what's ahead at Calvary. But yet He prayed with a heart of submission, not my will. In this particular passage, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Our world today sees submission as, as weakness. Boy, if you submit, you're weak. You're not independent. You know, it's all in who you submit to. That's what makes the difference. And when you submit to a perfect God, that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength. That's a sign of wisdom. You may never go to the Holy Land. But even if you never go, I hope you'll be able to very quickly find Gethsemane. You may not ever see an olive tree in person. You may not ever feel a breeze that blows down through that valley. But listen to me, if you can find a place of solitude and a place of sorrow and a place of submission, trust me, you can find Gethsemane. There was a phrase that my dad used when I was a kid that I absolutely hated, and it usually occurred when we were on long trips. Uh, my dad bought vehicles that were not the newest. As a matter of fact, they were the kind of vehicles where the air conditioning worked great in the summertime whenever the windows were down and he was driving 60 miles an hour. And usually the fabric on the inside was torn. It certainly was not a model vehicle, but... I remember there'd be times I was an only child, so my mom and dad in the front seat of something like an old Ford Galaxy. And I'm sitting in the back there, and we kids were so impatient. And I want to tell you children that are here in this room, listen to me. Just be careful what you say. One day you're going to reap what you sow. When you sit in a car and you incessantly ask, how much longer? Just keep doing it. You better do it a whole lot because one day you're going to hear it yourself. And the whole time, I hope your dad's in the car saying, uh-uh, don't say a thing to those kids. We're driving down the road and I would look at my dad and I'd say, Dad, how much longer? And he'd give me an answer. And at the time, I absolutely hated this answer. But he would say it with a little uncertainty in his voice and he'd say, oh, just a little farther. Five minutes later, how much longer? Just a little, f I hated that phrase, a little farther. I detested it. He was putting me off. But now that I'm a parent and maybe one day I'll be a grandparent and I'll hear all those phrases, but I'm learning, I'm learning doesn't mean that I have to like that phrase, but I'm going to tell you something. When I read Matthew 26 and I saw what Jesus was willing to do, my perspective of that phrase changed. And instead of being a kid so sick of hearing the phrase a little farther, I pray that God will make me a full-blown adult who's willing to go a little farther and do what Jesus did.